Well, hello, everybody. And it's amazing to see so many people here. Um, and uh, lots, lots of names I'm meeting or seeing for the first time. Um, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Mel Hauser, I use she, they pronouns. And I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong, Vermont. Welcome to Brain Club, our weekly community conversation on everyday brain life. So um, this topic was requested by you all last month um, when we talk about, um, oh, hold on, oh, there it is. Okay. Um, when we, last month in August, um, we talked about um, so many different aspects of autistic culture. And um, unfortunately, this is the reality of so many um, neurodivergent people's lives is is uh hovering in and out of, of burnout and so uh we're gonna take a deeper dive into that tonight but first by way of introductions our community agreement since there are so many uh, new folks tonight um all forms of participation are okay here you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we do not expect anything of you. We don't need you to look at the camera. We don't need you to sit still. You can walk, you can move, you can fidget, you can stim, you can eat, you know, all the things. Um, do what needs doing. And everyone is welcome here. Um, and uh, all communication is okay. So you can unmute and use mouth words. You can type in the chat box. You can gesture, whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. Um, let me actually, as I say that, I'm going to actually now put the um, the, the chat um, in my view now. Oh, wonderful. Hello, Elliot and River. Um, I, uh, just a word about language. You will hear myself, maybe other people, but at least myself um, using identity first language. I am autistic. It's part of my identity. Um, uh, each person is welcome to use the language that describes their own experience. And um, in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, we really want to respect and protect one another's access needs, including giving space for others to participate, given that, um, and by the way, per, um, uh, participate in, in any way that, that you'd like to. Observation is a completely valid form of participation. Um, and um, for those who would like to be entering the conversation, sometimes when um, thoughts ping pong so quickly, it's hard to enter a conversation sometimes. And so we will often tonight um, pause, pause for processing. And lastly, I'll say that today is for education purposes, especially talking about, you know, a, a, a really loaded term like burnout. Um, and of course there being, you know, um, uh, an, an overlap between burnout and depression. Um, uh, they, they are different and they often co-occur. And it's really important that to just name the thing that uh, this is for education purposes only. We're not going to be giving medical advice or medical assessment tonight. And that, you know, individual traumatic experiences are best processed in therapeutic setting. Last bit of access. Uh, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see live transcript closed captioning, but if you don't, try the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can also do the same thing and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. Um, before we get started, I want to make an announcement. Um, thanks to our amazing volunteer, Gray Costin. Um, we have the first quarter of Brain Club 2023, um, uh, the recordings directory all one place. So you don't have to like register for the separate months anymore if you want to go back and get archives. Um, so we will put the link in the chat. Um, I don't think Lizzie's here yet. Um, anyway, we'll get the link in the chat for anybody who wants, because it's not up, it's not yet up on the website. It will be up later tonight on the website, on the Brain Club website, um, but we'll put the direct link to the recording stack directory before you, oh, Sarah, you're on it. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, so here we are, it's May 2nd. We are kicking off our new month's theme, neurodivergent lived experiences. 
Um, what we know, of course, is that everyone has a different lived experience. And so that's why we have a community conversation. There will be things we have in common. There will be things that we don't. There will be things that are, you know, uh, people who are not here, not having their perspectives represented. Um, so just acknowledging that. Um, so tonight we'll be talking about neurodivergent burnout. Um, uh, next week, oh, hi, Krista and Xenia, what, wonderful. I'm glad you're all here. Um, next week we'll be looking at um, uh, so, some prompted by the uh, the annual Autistic Not Weird survey. For those of you um, who who are familiar with that, um, we're going to be looking at some, some 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 of those results and getting into conversation about autistic life experiences. We'll also be covering, as we often do, neurodivergent challenges at work, experiences of neurodivergent parents, and then our book chat for this month is The Reason I Jump um, by Naoki Higashida. And by the way, book chat, um, for those of you new to Brain Club, we don't expect anybody to read the book. If you do, awesome. But otherwise, we structure a book chat um, as though no one's read the book. So please join us, even if you have not. So... We talk a lot at Brain Club about the concept of niche construction. So niche construction, Dr. Thomas Armstrong's concept um, from the book, the, uh, the, the Power of Neurodiversity. The idea is that you learn about your brain and you design a life that's based on that. But unfortunately, often we have the opposite of that. We have the square peg being hammered and destroyed to fit into the round hole. And um, when we think about the social model of disability, where the issue is not deficits of the individual, you know, certainly there are things that are hard, there are like legitimately things that are impaired, um, but the amount of disability that someone experiences is relative to the barriers to access in the world. If I'm a wheelchair user and I approach a building that has a ramp, I'm going to have less disability than if I approach a building that does not have a ramp. And when it comes to invisible disability, disability you can't tell just by looking, um, it's the same exact thing. Um, but it's just that often we don't talk about it that way or that lots of other people don't talk about it that way, even if we're talking about it that way. And so when we think about how we all have access needs, access needs being anything that is required to meaningfully participate, fully participate in one's environment or community. We all have access needs. It's just that for neurodivergent people, it's a lot less likely that we have our access needs met by the defaults of society. And of course, examples of, of access needs, physical environment, emotional, communication, personal, like all kinds of access needs. Um, and most people don't know what their access needs met. I'm going to, one of my, one of my favorite quotes um, from, from an ABB village member. I don't know what my access needs are. I just know they're not being met. Yep. So what happens is um, not only, maybe we have a setting, an equation. I'm going to set you up. I'm going to set up an equation. So, you know, uh, I'm, I'm mixing analogy, you know, reference points, but you know, uh, an ingredient, the ingredient of access needs not being met. Um, next ingredient is insufficient dopamine. So uh, autistic and ADHD brains are dopamine bound brains, dopamine requiring brains. Dopamine is the brain chemical implicated in rewards, motivation, pleasure, engagement. But for the dopamine bound brain, we require dopamine for literally everything, for motor function and coordination, for starting and stopping an activity, for starting and stopping an idea. Um, dopamine feels good to all brains, but when the dopamine bound brain does not have dopamine, we literally can't do the thing. And by the thing, I mean all things. So that's ingredient number two. When we don't have enough dopamine, we have two flavors, one or both flavors of inertia, 
foot on the gas. I start doing the thing and I can't stop doing the thing. Maybe it starts with something that feels pretty good, turns into hyper focus and then stuck. Can't stop doing the thing, including talking about the thing or thinking about the thing. Version two, stuck on the break, cannot initiate the thing. Can't get out of bed in the morning. Can't, you know, avoiding showering, procrastinating awful tasks. This is dopamine deficiency. And you combine those things, chronic access needs unmet with dopamine deficiency. And what you have is burnout. Um, so this is a really interesting article that I would highly encourage folks to take a look at. Um, and is Lizzie here with links yet? Yes, Lizzie is here and I also have the links if we need them. Amazing. All right, I can't see and I dragged the chat into a place I can't see. I actually should address this. I should like stop sharing and actually access the chat. Okay, now I can see things. Oh, amazing. Okay, now I can see everything. And I can see you. Sorry about that. Having all of your internal resources exhausted beyond measure and being left with no cleanup crew, defining autistic burnout. Um, and this comes from a group of autistic researchers. So what is burnout? So neurodivergent burnout is a common condition experienced by neurodivergent people of all ages. And it has three main components. Number one, mental and physical exhaustion. Two, loss of tolerance to stimuli. And three, loss of skills. What do I mean by loss of skills? I'm gonna show you what my desk looks like. That is what my desk looks. Actually, it's actually it's actually worse right now compared to when that picture was taken um, last week. So there are 12 dirty cups and dishes on this desk. Um, it's, it's, it's not laziness, it's burnout. It's a loss of executive functioning skills. And um, this may also, um, there's all kinds of skills, right? So it might be motor skills, executive functioning skills, communication skills, perspective taking skills. Um, this, this, um, this, 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 this may present in all kinds of ways that we'll talk about. Lots of people ask, what do I do? So I'm in burnout. Let's say we're going to talk, and we'll, we'll talk more about the different presentations of burnout. Um, in, in a minute, but the last the last educational piece I wanted to, to to share is like the the management part. Like, what do I do? There's no magic. Um, it's that when we again the ingredient of not have your access needs met, not have enough dopamine. Um, that you know another way of looking at that is that the demands of your life are exceeding your capacity chronically. There's no magic. You have to shift that ratio of capacity to demand and AKA get your access needs met. Some 50,000 foot view points about that. Dropping the demands that you have the autonomy agency privilege to drop that may not be the core demands of your life charging your battery more than you drain your battery, shifting your self-expectations. Um, like for me, I look at this desk. I really don't have any judgment of myself about this. It took like a long time to get to that place. Um, really only re recognizing this, 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 this state um, as burnout for, you know, the past couple of years, knowing about that sleep as much as humanly possible. And again, there are demands of life that interfere with that. And um, the number of hours you spend sleeping may not actually be uh, contributing to restorative sleep. Autistic people, ADHD people too, um, uh, have higher rates of, of, of sleep apnea 
So, so looking at this, you know, just it's going to be outside the scope of what we talk about today, um, but thinking about the co-occurring medical conditions that are, are more common for neurodivergent people that may be really very much contributing to the drain of battery, sleep apnea, mast cell activation, dysautonomia, chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, these are all very, very common in neurodivergent people. So I'm going to open this up to conversation. Um, what I'm hoping we can start off with is to hear from folks about how did you recognize you were in burnout? And once you did, what was helpful? And this this question was asked by by some by one of our regulars um, uh, about like prompting: Is there anything that people in your life can do? There may not be, um, but I wonder um, if anyone has anything they'd like to share about this. All right, so. Um, Christina says in the chat, I think sometimes my expectations of what I was supposed to do just put me further in it. I needed rest, but stressed about my rest. So I was rest when I was resting, I was not resting. Yeah. And it may not even necessarily be like other people's expectations. It could be expectations on oneself. Um, uh, we, uh, if, 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 if you follow all brains belong on Instagram, we did a video over the weekend about, you know, the, the, the experience of PDA in burnout. Um, and it's like, when someone tells you to rest, my limbic system will not allow me to rest. Um, so there's, there's that, um, Jenny says, uh, writing my job became harder and harder and harder and harder. Thought I was hitting dementia, right? Loss of skills. Kelly says, or I do all the other tasks instead of the one I'm struggling to get through. Yeah. Jenny says, something others can do, help with getting food. Yes. Cutting up um, uh, uh, and planning meals. Vegetables. Food is, so what'd you say? That was the typo. It should have said veggies, not legs. I figured that I was like, I don't know what that means. I'm not hip enough to know the lingo. I'm just going to skip it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. Cutting up vegetables. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah. Food is a chore. Food is a huge executive functioning project. Um, like preparing food is not a task. It's a project. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to just, um, I'm going to get out of share screen mode so I can see you all. Here we go. Um, uh, nature lover says what happened to me was burnout, but frankly, I did not realize I was in it until I was coming out of it. Right. Because self-monitoring is a high level executive function. So most of us are not able to self-monitor when we're deep in burnout. At first I thought I was depressed. Very common. Um, I kept functioning on a daily basis, but as I felt better and better, I could see that I had been functioning below normal for some years. That resonates with me. How about others? Yeah, lots of hands. Um, uh, Lauren says, uh, me today, I wonder how long someone can live just on frozen pizza. <laughs> yeah. Um, Allie says, I really resonated with a quote I've heard recently regarding juggling the many balls of life. Some are rubber, some of glass, which ones we are willing to let drop. Um, uh, bounce balls, uh, like taking a day off from work, but not cleaning the house. Glass balls, self-care, rest. I use this mental image when I feel overwhelmed, but too afraid to advocate for myself. Yeah, the, this reminds me that my needs are important. Allison says, I lost my ability to mask effectively. Yes. So masking, even though for most people, it is um, not a like conscious volitional choice. It's a subconscious um, loss of words right now. Yeah, that it's subconscious for most people. Still, um, uh, beneath that level of awareness, there is still executive functioning impulse control that is required for masking which is why many late identified neurodivergent adults get their diagnoses in the context of burnout, myself included. Um, and so one is it's loss of skills, um, but the, the losing the mask 
Um, uh, and again, when we think about, like, say, for example, in, with, when we think about autism, um, the DSM-5 criteria for autism are autistic distress behaviors. Um, and um, people make it to adulthood because they often have the um, that, that pattern of cortical or cor the cortex top part of the brain overriding limbic responses to things, which is a skill. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a skill worthwhile to have. It is a skill that is dangerous to overly rely upon. Um, so when that, when that is lost, um, people may appear more stereotypical in their distress behaviors. And that is certainly what happened for me. Um, Michelle says, I knew I wasn't functioning optimally at work, but it took a letter of reprimand to point out just how bad it had gotten. There wasn't a way to slow things down, though. I was I was under the gun to perform way better and immediately. So now it's now a threat response, which inhibits um, most, most performance. Not surprisingly, I wasn't able to instantly do that. And I got reprimanded again and have now been able to gear up to a better functionality, but still challenged, right? And still maybe not having your access needs met. Uh, CV says, yes, the PDA and burnout is so tricky. My brain needs a fake demand to avoid the demand, creativity to find ways to rest. Oh, yeah, that resonates with me. Uh, Christina says, I don't go to the store unless I body double now because grocery shopping is super hard now. Yeah, so you're um, in, in a culture of interdependence. Um, you're, you know, yeah. I still have to lay down for an hour after shopping, so I can't cook or do anything if I shop. Right, you're budgeting your spoons. Jenny says, when I was a medical resident and feeling well beyond maxed out, getting scolded for underperformance, I honestly had no idea how to put forth any further effort mentally and physically. Used to wish I would break my leg just to get rest. Not your veg, your leg. Um, yeah. CV said, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, CV says, I can't mask anymore and it feels unsafe. So it feels unsafe that you don't have your mask, that you can't use it when you need it. Is that what you mean by that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard. Stay there for a minute. I can't mask anymore and it feels unsafe. Anybody else experience that? Vicky says yes. I, we can talk to, right? Yeah, go for it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, I think for me, I've had that level of burnout and exhaustion where the the way I've like phrased it to myself is like, I, I just can't be nice. And so I'll tell, I mean, I can hold it together at work, but I tell my family, I just, I don't, I just say, I don't feel good. And I go to bed at like six 30 sometimes. And I guess maybe that's what I do when I feel like I can't mask anymore. Like I'm just not okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you, 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 I you hide, leave. I guess maybe, or, or I don't know. Yeah. Like, maybe like taking care. It feels really good. I just get, in yeah. Bed. Just yes. get in bed and I watch yes. TV or I read or I go to sleep at 6.30. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Um, uh, just catch, catching up in the chat, uh, Vicky says, whenever I lose my ability to mask, I lose my job. That's so common. That's so common. You know, and we wonder why autistic people have, you know, four to eight times more likely to be unemployed. This is what goes on. Linda says, when my ability to mask drops, I feel very vulnerable. I know I'm going to end up in some social situation that will bite me in the butt. Michelle says, I feel like other people can ask for help or admit they're struggling with something, but I feel like if I do that, I get in, I get in trouble and ignored or I'm told I'm making excuses and I just need to fix things. Dave says, learning to unmask around people who I feel safe with still feel the need to mask with most people. Yeah. Um, 
uh, 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 Aiden says, uh, masking for me drains everything out of me. Right. So it's, it's, it's both. So it's that, um, masking contributes to burnout by draining battery. And when, when burnout reaches a certain point, masking may not even be possible anymore, but it was part of the drain to begin with. Thanks for making that point. Um, uh, and, and Kat says now automatically, inst now, instead of automatically fawning or people pleasing, my body goes into flood mode and that's scary. Yeah. So let's take that and connect that to Christina's point from, um, a, a little higher up in the chat, um, that I missed. Sorry. Can you talk about meltdown frequency and can others share experiences? Mine got worse and more frequent. Yeah, that is super common. Um, you know, I think that often when people internalize dysregulation, um, there is, uh, you know, the cortical override that makes that possible. It's part of the mask. You're still really, really, really distressed. Um, and as the mask comes off, or, um, you know, either either because you actually feel safe in a situation um, or because you're in burnout and you can't mask, then often that externalized dysregulation um, does 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 tick up. Uh, so Jenny's asking about flood. So flood referring to actually so 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 often at Brain Club, I use this particular uh, this this visual from neuroplastic that shows like all the F's of dysregulation. So flood is just referring to like flood of ideas, overwhelm. Kat says, I'm flooded with emotion. I can't think anymore. I can lose time. It feels like an electrical storm in my brain. Scroll, scroll, uh, 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 Amy. Hi, Amy. I didn't know you were here. I was like, where's Amy? <laughs> um, I just wanted to say the um, part about feeling unsafe when, you, when you're no longer able to mask. Um, the mask has been like really a lot harder um, to keep on and I think that people who are used to being around me presenting in one way then all of a sudden I'm sharp or I'm blunt what they would consider blunt or rude um it can start feeling really unsafe and I think the thing that's been most helpful for me is is basically having validation or some accurate reflection so if like if you can go to somebody and say hey this is a scenario that happened what do you think? And if your access needs aren't being met or, or your overwhelm or in your meltdown and your environment isn't supporting you and being safe, but if you can find somebody, you know, even somebody in the AB village that can kind of accurately reflect what's happening to you, that's for me has, I've been able to gain safety in that way. Um, so I just wanted to, to say that, like, I, I wanted to honor the fact that it's like, it can feel so, um, challenging particularly when we start when I start acting in a way that is like authentic to me but it's not how I'm used to even perceiving myself and so um just kind of getting just validation or hey could you see me in that scenario how overwhelmed I was and and honoring yourself in it sharing that Amy I think that you know and and and, and we've we've talked about this in a couple of different ways in, in brain club before around like the access need of, of knowing where I am in time, space, and relationship. Um, that if someone, it, it, it's an access need. It's not that like that you need external validation or so it's not, it's not validation. It's that I, I am, I need interdependent appraisal of, of this situation. Uh, Michelle says, I battle with the urge that I have to catch everyone up about why I'm different now, as if it's less worthy of being seen than the masked version. Vicky says, when I, yes, when I lose my mask and I'm suddenly acting differently around people, I'm sometimes seen by others as being fake or manipulative. My mother told me, you were never like this. Uh, Jenny says, uh, does anyone else experience a sense of not wanting to be looked at? That's common. I, I, uh, I wore very baggy clothes, hats, et cetera, in high school and college felt like um, men's eyes on me was like burning me with acid. Even today, I sort of feel that way sometimes, just don't want people to look at me. Maybe it's because I'm being viewed as being forced to perform. Uh, Dave's, Dave agrees. 
Um, uh, my six-year-old, that is very clearly um, part, it's an access need of like, I don't want people to look at me. Um, don't, you know, I, I, I'm not giving you consent to take a picture of me. Um, anyway, that's, it's common. Kelly. I was going to say pretty much the same thing. My older son hates having his picture taken unless he is given like explicit consent and knows what's going to be going on with the picture. Um, and I too, I hate like being, I don't want to be noticed when I'm out and about. I just want to go about my business. And I said that the other day and my younger son kind of laughed at me and I was like, why are you laughing? And he's like, mom, you have like blue and purple and green hair. And I was like, well, that's because that's what I like to see when I look in the mirror. I'm not doing it for other people. And like, if anything, like sometimes I want to like hide my hair when I go out in public so people can't see it because it's mine. It's for me. It's not for them. And like, I kind of helped him understand, but it was, it was just like that little moment of like, well, I'm actually doing it for me, not for you. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to look at me. And uh, I think it was something he didn't quite understand, but then he kind of did. But definitely not wanting to be looked at is a, is a thing. Yeah, and there's quite a few people in the chat. Um, Jade says, I've hated my picture being taken my entire life. I've always been told, quote, to stop being so shy or stop being fussy. It always felt shamey. Yeah, as though there's one default way. And the default way is that, like, everyone loves taking their picture. Like, obviously, we've even in, like, the span of three seconds we've just like there's a million people who don't want their picture taken uh jenny says i feel like uh being looked at requires me to hold a second image of myself in my head i used to call it self-objectification now but maybe it's just the act of masking Ooh, that is very interesting and it's also um it it, it it's also like a like 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 a brain thing. It's an executive functioning thing to zoom out and self monitor. Um, so that's 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 also really interesting. Um, uh, uh, Jenny says this hits me with Zoom cameras at some point during the pandemic. Having the camera on started to literally hurt. Right, and 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 because in many environments it's not normalized to shut your video off. Like, why would you not want someone to be their most comfortable self when they're meeting with you? Steve says there are whole cultures where they regard having your picture taken means the theft of one's soul. That's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. So um, we've 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 heard um, from from lots of folks of some signs that they are in burnout. Um, what what is helpful? Um, we've heard so so we, we've heard we've we've heard about sleep. We've heard about like you know kind of tricking oneself into resting. Um, what else is what else is is it can has been helpful for folks either that you do yourself or that other people do with you or for you? Ellie says brain club. That's awesome. Uh, Kim says uh, I feel like being seen by others is a demand for me to acknowledge them in a socially appropriate way. There's the expectation to smile, to make eye contact, to say hi or chat. It's too much. Yes, yes, so much. This. Kat says uh, one thing that has helped me was to write down everything that I was going. Uh, doing or trying to do minute by minute, I realized I couldn't possibly do it all. I made some tough decisions about what I was going to stop doing and focused on being okay with what I could do. I had to let go of the goal of being so productive, especially because we can link, um, uh, hearkening back to, just used hearkening in a sentence, um, February Brain Club on urgency culture and how, you know, productivity, urgency culture, it's all part of, you know, oppressive power systems. So there's that. Um, Jenny says, uh, honestly, I have to say that what helped me out of burnout was getting out of, of, uh, of, of mode. Like getting out getting, of survival mode. Sorry. Survival mode. Oh, I missed your, you, you added a, a word. Yes. Sorry. Uh, survival mode. And that required having more material security, a partner, stable housing. Otherwise I was in full survival mode and burnout. Right. Because how could you not have been? And that's where like that, the idea of like, like dropping demands 
there's so much privilege associated with being able to drop most demands. CB says stimming helps, lots of deep pressure and radical acceptance. Uh, Christina uh, says, honestly, I don't know how, how, to, how to social much right now, so I'm mostly very picky about anything I say yes to, right? You're, you're meeting your access needs. Elizabeth says, I'm on a leave of absence for work and apply for short-term disability while I make a plan, but I can never go back to that level of pretending I'm okay ever again. Yes, um, I'm being extremely honest with my closest people. Steve says, uh, sometimes I need a day to freak out. Yep. Um, Aiden says, I'm taking notes here because I have burnout cycles a lot. I would think I'm okay and then I go back in. So that's common. So that's really common. So you recover enough to know what's happening. And then without like a major paradigm shift of that capacity to demand ratio, right back in. Vicky says, when I'm in burnout, I need to keep the audiobooks playing all the time. I don't know if I'm co-regulating with a calm voice or if the progression of the story helps me to keep moving. Oh, I love that. Um, Michelle says, I tell those around me when I feel myself going into, quote, alien mode, aka no expectation to human, <laughs> which, which, which you're defining as eye contact, talking, facial expressions, responding to communication. It lasts different lengths of time, but sometimes even 10 to 15 minutes totally demand free helps you catch your breath. Well, Christina yeah, uses hammock it. swing for squeezing. Go ahead, Sarah. I was just going to say we have a hand raised. Oh, I can't see that. Oh, I look know, at that. It's blending right in the corner. Yep. Hi, Elliot River. Hi, this is Elliot. Um, I I was thinking about how I often, um, so like I've been not wanting to show up to work lately and like not all the time, but sometimes. And so I'm realizing that like, I just need to forgive myself for not being able to just show up and kind of like just call out autistic, I guess. <laughs> and I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily, I'm not out at work in that way, but I think that I just need to forgive myself and, and get that rest. And cause I think in my brain, it's like, I'm not supposed to need rest in that particular way or like there's nothing like wrong like there's no like I don't have a cold or anything like that but actually like I think I do sometimes just need rest and recharge time yes yes um and I I think you know when, when we really think about you can't like if your cell phone runs out of battery you can't like use it, it it's just off right like but why is it this idea that you can somehow push through like if your battery's drained your battery's drained you have to charge your battery and you know that and that's what that's what the burnout conversation is about it's the decades of cortically overriding like the law of physics that says that when you drain your battery it's done Nature lover saying, if anyone has a source to share for calm voice, uh, I like Andy P on Headspace, but 10 minutes is about the max he speaks. I'd love a 60 minute recording. Yeah, crowdsourcing for calm voices. Um, Michelle says, I, uh, um, oh, I read Michelle's. And then Jenny added, um, I love the idea of simply telling people, though I might pick a different phrase because we're human in our own way. Steve says that there's too many professions which are structured in such a way that neurodivergent people are excluded by virtue of the needlessly relentless demands. Right. They are needless. It's the culture they perpetuate because the cultures for no other reason. Yeah. Education, healthcare, so many different fields. I think that in and just in the in the chat, other folks are 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 collecting um ideas for soothing voices. That's lovely. I find that um ABB really has helped me prevent burnout. Um not only brain club, but I think just like the small medical groups and any supportive way. I think there's a part of me that's like, if I don't have to go and explain myself, or even if I can go and just just say what's not working or what is working and the shared experience, I think has prevented a ton of, of burnout for me. Um, yeah. 
Thank you for saying that. And I think that, right, that's just like part of, part of authentic connection is that like feeling understood by people. Um, you know, I can say even, um, I, I, I had a conversation with, with several of our staff here about, about like, uh, like, I thought I was going to like be having this like big conversation, like we're going to have to sit down and talk. I'm in burnout. And they're like, I know you've been this way. You, you, you've been in burnout for a long time. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, so I think there is just this, it's, it's important. It's, it's, it's important to feel understood by people. Elizabeth says, um, once I realized that there are different kinds of rest to help me to dial in with what I needed, rest from decisions. Oh, I love that. Permission to not be helpful. Oh, that's amazing. Um, CD says something that's that's been helping me is programming my AAC as a support mirror uh, or warm body voice for things. That's cool. That's awesome. Uh, Jenny says, not having to constantly be proactive to think of what others need and meet it ahead of time. I'm so programmed to do that and it's exhausting. Christina says, uh, having a therapist that's neurodivergent helps takes me, it has taken me a super long time to find one, but I finally have one and actually getting tools now. That's great. One of the other things that I, you know, um, you know, related to, um, to, to the concept of rest and, you know, all the different types of rest, but like, there's also this, um, fairly universal thing that like when people don't sleep enough or have like restorative sleep enough, um, it, it takes a toll on one's brain. Um, and yet it is really hard to sleep enough. I think that often when um, there's a variety of reasons why people stay stay up late. That's when maybe that's when there's time to like engage in their monotropic focus or like you know have uninterrupted time that is just for them. Um, but but the, the sleep thing is 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 part of this equation. But I think that often people don't don't talk about. Um, Isabel says, uh, could you speak to chronic illness versus burnout and their interaction? Oh, well, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, in, 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 in similar ways to the fact that sleep deprivation, um, you know, contributes to burnout, you know, chronic inflammation. That's why, like, I even had a slide about that, that if you have any chronic thing you're dealing with, it drains your battery extra. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it doesn't even need to be something you know, that would have drained your battery five years ago. It's draining your battery extra now. So whether that's, you know, chronic pain, um, you know, really anything, it's just draining your battery and you're much more likely to get to a place where your battery's drained. Lizzie says, um, I was reading an article about burnout this week um, and it was saying that social connection can help. And I'm so thankful we have the ABB Village. That's awesome, Lizzie. Um, Jenny says, I think about my autistic mother versus me a lot. She has thrived as an older adult. And I think it's because her life is totally tailored to her niche, niche, niche construction. My dad is completely devoted to making sure her needs are met at all times. And as a result, she's a superstar in her pursuits, whereas I typically don't have help with anything. Yep. Um, Michelle says, I don't process my life in real time and process it so much in my sleep that it feels too intense sometimes to even lay down because of the flood. That's a really important insight. And I think that, you know, um, maybe, maybe part of the part of shifting that, you know, capacity to demand ratio might be, you know, finding ways to get that access need met. Um, because if it's, it's, uh, yeah, I think that's a really, like that self-awareness piece is really, I think, really important. But I, I just want to create some space, especially for anyone who, who would like to, to share who hasn't had a chance yet. What else belongs part of this conversation? 
Elizabeth says, I'm thinking about how sometimes seeking to meet my needs can also drain my battery. Like I'll go for a coffee with a friend and it will feel great, but I will still need a nap. What is that? I mean, it's both. Um, so um, I enjoy interacting with most of the people I interact with in a given day. So it's not, that's not always been true, um, but it's, it's true now. Um, and at the end of the day, I'm exhausted every day. Um, so they're both true. So it's, and it's, and, 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 you know, I'll, 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 we talk about conflicting access needs between people. Um, you know, uh, if, 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 if my six-year-old um, has an access need to like discharge um, her voice in really loud ways at the same time that I need quiet, we're going to have conflicting access needs, but we also have, we can have internal conflicting access needs. I need sameness and novelty at the exact same time. That's really hard. Um, and that's how it is. So I need alone time and social time at the exact same time. That's really hard. That's where like, you know, parallel play for adults is so successful. Um, Christina says, how does one rest while they're taking care of others? It's like lots of grace for each other. Yeah. And, you know, it may, be, it, it may not be that, you know, one might not have the privilege of like, dropping all demands, but maybe you're dropping some. So like, I have to take care of my child and I don't clean the bathroom. Um, I drop other demands. I'm still a kid. Uh, 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 <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's another, um, an, another uh, Instagram post we had last week showing all the, all the, all the, the executive functioning demands dropped. Um, examples. Jade says, my wife and I will have two TVs going on with two different games we're playing and we're catch up with each other every couple of hours, even though we're in the same room. It's awesome. Um, Steve says, uh, we were supposed to stop parallel play when we were four, right? So like, that's that neuronormative narrative of like, just because you turn a certain age, like it's that, that now there's only one right way to interact and like how unhelpful that narrative is. And that's the, that's the narrative that's like out there. And I, 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 uh, I, 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 I knew even in chat box format, I, 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 I knew you were saying that with a flare of irony. Says I do so much better on the weeks when my kids are with me. I share them 50-50 with other parent because I have a clear, full schedule and expectations. When I'm not masking, I don't really know how to prioritize and schedule my own needs. It's easier to focus on kids. Yeah. So, I mean, that's another example of like you've, you've identified an access need. When there's a difference between one environment or set of circumstances than another, um, and one feels better and one feels worse, it may very well be that something actually is reflective of your access needs being met versus not. Um, Lizzie says, I drop demands for myself. I shower less, right? Because shower is not a task, it's a project, a huge executive functioning load. Clean my house less, use paper plates. I stop feeling bad about trying to be green. Yes, 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 yes. Because in a world where something has to give and you only have so much capacity, you have to you have to triage where you spend your spoons and, you know, you'll contribute to, to the environment in other ways. Yeah. Um, Steve says, I want parallel play. Just others want to blabber and interact. Yes. Yes. Um, so again, being really clear around, around, around access needs. Like, so for example, um, you know, um, uh, actually, I'll tell a story. Um, when when we were preparing to launch All Brains Belong, Luna, who was four at the time, said, Mama, I think there should be a room in All Brains Belong where people just go and they play side by side and they don't talk to each other. And you should have another room where people can go and they can play together. Um, like, just four. Like, what a genius move. Like, yes. Just, just being really transparent around access needs. TV says, I'm not glad that there are so many of us that relate to burnout, but it feels good to be here in community and share about it. Yeah, yeah. And to think though, think about how, 
how many of us have been in this state or similar states and not known that it was burnout and felt really badly about ourselves about it? And how many people are out there in the world who still feel really badly about themselves? And by the way, this is not linear. You could like be at peace and know this is burnout and like, you know, be you know, not judgy of yourself, but then, you know, next time the internalized ableism will settle right back in. Um, it's, it's, it's a constant process of unlearning and, and rewiring those neural pathways. Michelle says my extroverted PDA son is, is hyperverbal and I'm introverted PDA and I go, um, so, so you lose the ability to speak um, more, um, the more, more he demands and constantly uh, verbally responds. So we've gotten to a place now where I can tell him my body's running out of talking energy and he's starting to understand. That's awesome. That is awesome. Um, I have similarly found that like explicitly and openly talking about my access needs you know, even with my six-year-old, like, I mean, she gets it. She's like, oh, yeah. And, you know, yet, yes, it's because, um, yeah, I think, I think, I think she gets it because we have many, many, many similar access needs, but it's also, I think, I think young children are, they start off being more open and it's like the, the lifetime of messages of, of growing up in the world that interfere with that. And that's what we're all having to unlearn so much. Um, uh, Nature Lover says, I definitely decided my, my daughter did not love me when I was in burnout, yet it's so obvious to me that she does love me very much. Yes, yes. Um, Jenny says, before I knew I was neurodivergent, I used to tell people I was getting overstimulated, which is which it pretty much is, although a lot of people I think can't identify with that. Yeah. Um, nature lover uh, says the session's so packed and phenomenal sharing and ideas and information. Thank you all. That's wonderful. That's great. And uh, Christina says, I realize now that break I took in college was burnout. These days in middle school, I'd come home and went, went, went right to bed was burnout. Yes. The time I had my son, I didn't want to see anyone for six months. Burnout. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's, you know, th this is, you know, even in young children, you know, young children who have like regressions, burnout, that's, 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 that's what this is. Um, it's, you know, capacity exceeding demands. So, um, I think that one of the things, you know, there's, because we come from, you know, we're at a, many people are at a place where that capacity to demand ratio is very difficult to shift because the like core demands of life, one does not have agency or autonomy or privilege to drop, you know, like, uh, you know, if somebody has a job, they can't just quit it. They have to have a job. Um, or if there's, you know, really, really just, just any number of really difficult things, um, and it's, 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 I think the narrative of what's happening as it happens, I think, I think for many people is another independent source of battery drain. So like just becoming familiar, more familiar with your own experience and having a different narrative as it's all unfolding, I think actually can have a, a subtle yet profound impact on, on that equation. So if you're in a terrible job, um, and you're clear about what your access needs are, and you are endeavoring to have them met, and it's not happening, and you can still zoom out and recognize that it's the environment that's interfering with your access needs, not because you're broken or defective and there's nothing wrong with you, that shift can be really, really impactful. You know, if you can shift to a place where you, you know, you blame the environment instead of blaming yourself, that's huge. So with that, I am um, really, really um, grateful to all of you for being here and participating in your own way. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Um,
uh, uh, thank you, Mary, uh, to help to, helpful to know what it is, even if there's no way to stop it. It's just a huge shift. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. So uh, next week again, we'll be we'll be taking a look at the um, autistic not weird survey results on um, autistic life experiences, and I think will lead to some good conversation. Um, and um, I look forward to seeing you then. Oh, Lizzie, thank you. Oh, yes. Okay, two things. All right. So eight. All right. So so Lizzie is reminding me to tell you that right now at seven o'clock. Um, uh, Vermont Public is going to uh, replay. Um, uh, there was a there was a um, Vermont edition this afternoon um, on on autism, and um, I was one of the one of the interviewees. Um, and it's going to be replayed right now, so the link is in the chat, but it'll be on the website. Even if you're not watching it now, it'll still be up there. Anyway. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one.